to this uh, deep dive session. I'm San Jose Itai, the moderator for today's session. We're going to have two nice talks, a discussion, two discussion groups as well, very interesting, I think, for this afternoon. Um, just to remind you of um, the different ways you can interact with um, the speakers, um, the social network, so uh, feel free to tweet using the Balkan um, hashtag. Also on Slido, you can ask questions if you like. Obviously, we also have um, direct questions with the audience, uh, but definitely use Slido for um, giving your feedback on the speakers. That's that's very useful. So in one minute, I'm going to activate the call for, for our speaker today. Our speaker also um, decided to share the presentation, so it will be the slides will be available afterwards. So um, thank you. Um, it's your time now. Um, so we have the chance to have um, Aske ready that is going to explain us about um, using or oh, which kind of machine learning techniques we can use for predictive uh, modeling. I think it's going to be very interesting. Uh, and so the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. You know, I come from uh, that part of the world uh, when a long time ago, a nice professor told me that when you greet people, you should expect them that you're going to return. So I'm going to say again, good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> you know, the most dangerous time to make a presentation is immediately after lunch. <laughs> Especially if they have provided you a really nice lunch. All the effort, uh, uh, I, I gotta be careful, I gotta be doing extra effort to communicate the message. So the next 45 minutes I'm gonna talk about some techniques, there are lots of techniques in machine learning, there are some techniques. I will give a few recommendations of my personal recommendations of what would be good techniques for you to use if you are working on machine learning. If you, are, if you want to start a, a tech company yourself, a machine learning company, I would also make, uh, I would recommend a few use cases and a few techniques you can work on, which will be extremely easy to get money from VCs. I live in California, in Central Valley, and, and I've seen a lot of my friends starting and myself from there a couple of times. And there are a, a, a few interesting uh, ideas on how to pitch an idea, and I'll talk about that too. But today I'll talk about predominantly how, what technique you could use uh, for different types of predictive models. Uh, some really basics of uh, anomalies of when you want to make a prediction, you're predicting what's going to happen in the future, and you can predict what's going to happen in the future based on what you know about the past or the reality today. And further analysis of what's the reality today would be to identify what is normal, what is not normal, what is something abnormal. What is unusual? What is novel? What is uh, what is strange? These are different words you use to understand the data and then make sense of it and eventually make a prediction. So if you plot the data you have, you can find different types of anomalies. For example, X2 and X1 seem to be anomalies. And these are called global anomalies because in the context of the entire set of data, X1 and X2 are completely dissimilar. They're very far away and hence make sense to be dissimilar. But how about X3, which is so close to one of the clusters here? And that also could be outlier or abnormal or unusual, which we call as local outlier. And depending upon what type of use case, what is that you're trying to find out? Are you trying to find out uh, what's the fraud transaction or you're trying to find out which customer is going to spend more money or you're trying to find out which patient will stay in the hospital for longer after you do a surgery, and hence as an insurance company, you can figure out whether you want to really sponsor a patient or not. So all of these things can be. So some of the use cases I will mention may sound not the right things to do, especially in the insurance uh, uh, healthcare sector, but lots of insurance companies and hospitals are actually making predictions about what type of patient you are, and, and so that they can make more money and save more money. Just a few quick uh, explanations. What is normal is you find almost the same type of data points. In this case, of course, the faces of uh, 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 a lion, and then maybe I think you have a different color of lion, so uh, a tiger, so you actually, it's a little novel. But what's an anomaly is uh, which are distinctly different. So when you start analyzing data, 
how many of you call yourself data scientists or data engineers? Oh, oh my God, okay. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, the same professor who told me when I was about to make a presentation in the afternoon, he said, ask so many questions, especially easy questions, so that people, I think, are engaged and so that they can pay attention. So that's the first question. When you analyze data, you would understand what's happening in the data. And that's one of the fundamental expectations of a data scientist, data engineer, machine learning engineer, AI engineer, all of these people. Uh, so when you look at the data, whatever type of data, you, sh you, you would be able to make sense. And that's a prerequisite for uh, uh, fi figuring out the use cases. Some more data points, for example, you actually have something called point anomaly. If you normally spend money uh, or, or customer is spending money in double digits and suddenly you find an unusually high amount of money coming in, that's, a, that's an anomaly, something suspicious. Not necessarily a fraud, but it could be. Or something like a collective anomaly, you see all the same amounts of money being spent on this almost the same uh, uh, customer location, maybe almost under similar timings. So that's, that, that's another insight into the data about what may be going wrong. And there are more such examples too. Now, before you look at the slide, look at me for a minute. Just keep, keep, pay attention to me. When you do predictive maintenance, you always look for correlations. You know, in statistics, there's a, a fantastic quotation. Correlation is not causation. If you ever go to a grocery store, Migros is the name of the grocery store, I think. Migros, oh, that is the word. If you go to look for where the beer bottles are kept, there's a very high probability baby diapers will be kept close to that. Do you know why? There is a study done. People who are about to buy baby diapers, there's a very high probability that they end up buying baby, uh, sorry, beer, they will also buy baby diapers. Another correlation in the United States, whenever there's a hurricane is announced, Walmart stocks up Pop-Tarts, some sort of a candy. Another correlation, shark attacks increases when more ice cream is sold. These are correlations, perfectly proven mathematical correlations. They're not causations. Ice cream sale is not causing more sharp attacks. Those are maybe the effects of maybe a collective cause, which is not mentioned in the statement. So correlations are interesting for data scientists and machine learning experts or predictive modelers. I don't care what the cause was as long as I can find a correlation. So when I was doing the research for this presentation, I said, okay, let me find some strange correlation. Now look at the slides. I, I got some statistically valid data trying to correlate US spending on science, space, and technology and suicides by hanging, strangulation, and suffocation. Look at the amount of correlation. Every time it goes up, the other one goes up too. Per capita cheese consumption, number of people who die by becoming tangled in their bed sheets. <laughs> These are statistically valid data. I'm not making it up. Number of people who drowned by falling into a pool compared to films Nicolas Cage appeared in. Every time he appeared in more movies and less movies, the drownings went up and down. But perfect correlation. If you are a mathematician, if you are a statistician, this is a fantastic study. Divorce rate in Maine versus per capita consumption in Marguerite. There's a correlation. Let's look at the... Uh, How do I go to the next slide? Oh, there you go. Age of Miss America and murders by steam, hot vapors, and hot objects. Worldwide non-commercial space launches and sociology doctorates awarded in US. Two causes, two effects don't have any scientific connection with each other, but there's a correlation. The predictive modelers would look for such correlation if you don't find the real scientific reason. It doesn't matter sometimes, you can just base your 
models on such coordinated data. So, in uh, again, some fundamental details about uh, training, and because you already raised your hands that you're already a scientist, I won't explain too much, but I think you actually have some something called supervised uh, training and civil supervised training. Supervised training is when you give both the the good labels and the bad label data, and then give it to the model, and then the model learns both. Um, semi supervised is you train it only on all the good data, and then the model knows what's the bad data and hence predicts. Unsupervised anomaly is the model that has never seen uh, what is right, what is wrong, and then eventually starts predicting what is right, what is wrong. I want to quickly mention what are some of the common machine learning techniques available. Uh, by the way, these are only just four or five, but according to some research, there are at least 5,000 machine learning techniques available for this prediction stuff. Uh, I don't think humanly it's possible for anyone of us to, to understand and, and, and uh, implement all of them. But I'm going to talk about a few which I think have shown a lot of uh, uh, capability to build uh, the results what you're looking for. So you have the k nearest neighbor, then you have the random forest, uh, naive base, support vector machines, and of course logistic regression are some other ones I've seen a lot of people using. I'm going to show a few use cases now in uh, certain different industries. <coughs> Financial services, technology, maybe industry 4.0, I'm going to pick a few use cases. And I'll even explain how these use cases are solved. Uh, I'll try to do it in the next, uh, before at least 10 minutes I'll leave for question and answers. Um, but in between, if you have any questions, go ahead and interrupt me. At the bottom of every slide, I have a link provided for the research, wherever I picked it from, you can do further uh, uh, study from there. Uh, a quick uh, listing of some of the uh, techniques you may want to think about if you are not familiar with, uh, in terms of anomaly detection, and within anomaly detection, you have the point anomaly I mentioned earlier, you have certain classification-based methods available, you have the nearest neighbor-based methods available too, and clustering-based. I've seen many people using clustering, uh, especially the deep learning model, because you can actually create the latent representation of the data points, and then you actually do clustering, and, and it's very, very easy. Especially deep learning, uh, if you have uh, latent representations using n vectors, uh, n dimensional vectors, and n could be 30, 50, 100, 200, even as high as 500. Rare, but 500 is, 500 is possible too. Uh, but techniques are available. And some more examples, because you raised your hands, I'm not going to explain. This is a slide I picked up from, I think, sap.com. There are, these are so many techniques available. Algorithms available to make, to, to, to design a predictive model a solution. Okay, there's a company called Instacart, where you place an order online and then you actually go uh, someone goes to pick up the grocery items what you ordered for, and then they deliver it to your house. This company is extremely successful. Actually, a startup company been making lots of uh, good, good of business and making a lot of revenue and profits. One of the problems they actually have around 200 million grocery items they actually are uh, are picking up at any point of time uh, uh, in, in the whole country based on the order per uh, sent. One of the issue they have is once customer places an order, they need to know whether this item will be still in the store or not. Many times the stores do have an inventory management system which would be integrated with Instacart. They may know that certain item is in stock or not, but what if the item happens to be a popular item and by the, from the time you place the order to the time someone goes to pick it up, what if the item is not in the store? And that'd be a disappointment for the customer, a bad name for the company, loss of revenue, and so many other problems too. Loss of revenue for both the store and also for the Instacart. And, and, and for the person who's going to pick up, even that person would be making a, a, a wasteful error, uh, visit. So the whole problem is understanding the not forms. What is that I will not find in the store? Imagine you've got to update the system. This model actually works, updates every half an hour. It's going to look at 
200 million items. So if you were to, I'm going to explain uh, how it is done. If you were to do this, imagine the magnitude of, of the situation. Things are changing on a minute by minute basis because you have hundreds of shoppers from Instacart going to different types of stores to pick up items and they're constantly updating the database and we're talking about 200 million items. Some are more popular, some are less popular. Some are updated every minute, every second. Maybe some are updated maybe once in a half an hour, once in an hour. And you are, the model is actually have, is predicting every half an hour basis. Uh, these are some statistics to show uh, the found rate based on the time of the day in, in terms of the hours. And, and also there's a, a, a life chain for the model. You know the technique they use? Extremely calm, extremely efficient, useful, simple to use, and not a single line of code. Maybe one line of code you write in a machine learning model to make this. Have you heard of XG Boost? Extreme Gradient Boost. Extreme Gradient Boost is one of the most commonly used classification models uh, uh, by lots and lots of machine learning experts. If you don't know what technique to use for any use case, <laughs> use XG Boost. Classification. And you can get almost every predictive model at the classification phase. Um, um, like someone told me a long time ago, a recommendation model is a type of search model. A search model is a type of a classification model. A classification is a type of a recommendation model. A circular loop. Okay, this is the the entire process of a model. I'm not going to explain this right now. You can check these couple of links I have uh, picked up the blog from Instacart. Um, and and the, you, you do have, um, these are the various items which are found or not found, the green and the red. And uh, you see the predictive modeling on, on based on the uh, hours of the day, what would be, what the probability of right would be found or not found. But all that they're doing in this case is running extreme. XGBoost is a, a, a simple downloadable version of a software. You can download it. I think it has uh, maybe around 100 files together. But all that you do is just give the uh, input and the output and do XGBoost and you get the classification. Uh, also, another uh, research I have found in Instacart itself, doing an elastic forecast. What does this mean? For any distributor or supplier, imagine three orders coming in. Just for ease of simplicity, I'm going to make three orders. At 9 a.m., 10 a.m., and 11 a.m. 9 a.m., there's an order for 10 items to be distributed. And at 10 a.m., there are zero. At 11 a.m., there are five. For the first 10 orders, there's a huge action that happens on the supply side. You have the company distributors or the trucks going out and distributing, picking up in the warehouse and going and distributing. At the hour of 10 a.m., there's no action. At the hour of uh, uh, 11 a.m., there's a little bit of action, not the same. Many, in the supply chain management system, many distributors or many companies are trying to identify how to distribute the demand in such a way that there is a consistent impact on their supplier network. You don't want to have 10 orders in the morning and then you want to zero orders in the afternoon and then five orders in the evening. If you have a consistent number of orders, can you move the orders? For example, if people in the morning at 9 a.m. when they are on the way to work, it's, it's, it's a tendency of people to place an order for, let's say, milk because they just look for milk in the morning and there was no milk and they place the order for milk online and then go to work. At 10 a.m., 11 a.m., there's no one placing orders for milk. And then maybe in the evening again at 5 p.m., you see people pl placing orders for milk. Let's say. You don't want milk orders coming only in the morning and only in the evening. And the rest of the day, the, the, the trucks and the truck drivers are all unutilized. You want to orders come in a, in a distributed fashion, consistent distributed fashion. And that's not easy. Um, so for example, here, you, you find demand uh, 25 and, and, and 20, and then of course 15, where the demand spikes here, 
it's, it's a, this is the average demand, the demand drops, and then how do you uh, uh, manage this demand? Um, there's, so, there's some more information here. Um, I think they've used, uh, let's see, uh, I think they use support vector machines in this case to identify the uh, demand. I, I'm not explaining each, how each of the technique works. I'm only talking about how, which technique would work on what context. I hope that's okay with you guys, otherwise I can explain how SVM works versus uh, the variations of SVM or XG boots and stuff, which what was not the plan today. A few of the financial services use cases. Uh, have you applied for loans or ever or credit cards ever? Yeah, yes. Uh, I come from India, and normally in India, yes means this and no means this. So have you applied for credit cards? Yes, yeah. Um, or loans. So every time a financial institution is trying to find out whether they should offer you services or not, they were actually, they're making constant judgments on whether you're credit worthy or not. So here is a report, you can go to this, this, this uh, uh, research report on identifying the credit worthiness, especially with limited scoring data. If you don't have enough information about, about a customer, let's say a customer has come to this country for the first time, <coughs> Uh, uh, this customer is just finished his education and now getting into a, uh, he's, he's got a job, and hence he or she is going to now start spending money, so there's no historical information about the customer. In that case, um, in, in, to some extent it's called cold start. Uh, when you design recommendation engines for uh, companies like, let's say, Amazon, which is trying to make recommendations to you, what should be the, the, the item you should buy next, or when you or when you log into a system like a news uh, uh, app for the first time, the app would not know anything about you, it does not know what type of news to recommend to you. So that's called cold start, and in this case also it's like a cold start where the, the customer information is very, very limited. You just know only the name of the person, age, gender, um, the, the working capacity, and maybe education capacity, and, and stuff, but not really good information. So these are the features, the model is using around 15 different features, not too many. Uh, a typical credit uh, uh, monitoring company uh, or a credit management model in the United States apparently uses almost 200 to 300 features, including the digital footprint and all the activities uh, uh, what they do. By the way, um, I talked about credit uh, correlations at the start. There's another correlation I forgot. Uh, if you want to apply for a loan uh, among so many other features, if your mobile phone is an iPhone as opposed to an Android, the probability of you getting a loan will be higher if you have an iPhone. In other words, if you have an iOS device, like an iPad or an iPhone, you will get loans more easily than, uh, than, than the Androids. And the reason being that the, the expense part of it, how expensive the phone is, iPhone is, and there seem to be correlation between people owning iPhones and those who are more credit worthy. So next time you apply a loan, just show to the banker that you have an iPhone. Uh, so in this case, um, around 15 different features, there are three different techniques used. You have the logistic regression, you have uh, uh, the decision making, uh, the, um, uh, classification and the regression uh, technique, and you also have something called cascade correlation neural network. Cascade correlation neural network is a, a, a sexy term, but it's just nothing else but a, a, a feed forward a, a MLP, multilayer pressure trauma, which just, just makes a classification. So for just the 15 to 16 features, these three different models have shown really good score. If you look into the, the, the classification uh, results here, they have the error results and the evaluation criteria, the AUCs and Gini values, and the robustness test. All of these techniques have shown really good scores. So if you ignore the cascade correlation neural network, this part, and if you look only on the card and logistic regression, Logistic regression is a very a simple technique of saying yes or no based on a few data. This is a, a, a step brother to linear regression. And uh, I have seen a few examples of people using linear regression. Uh, if, you, if you start studying the data science today and if you pick up a book or a, or a blog, the most common example people use is to talk about how to uh, identify the value of a house 
like it's a three bedroom, two bedroom house in, in, in Munich or whatever place, how do you enter the value of the house? People just normally linear regression. And, and linear regression is one of the worst kind of models uh, taken to the world. So if you really don't want to work in that company and say your boss says, okay, take a data model, do something in linear regression and then after that quit. So linear regression does not work. Don't do linear regression. One of the problems with linear regression is it actually overfits very, very fast. And we don't know when the model is overfitting. And you understand the term overfitting? Yes, okay. So linear regression or over overfits really fast. So logistic regression I think really works well, and CART is another model too, uh, which really works in this case. Let's pick a, a different use case. Fraud transaction, whether it's a credit card or a warranty fraud, any type of fraud transaction, and there are different types of uh, fraud transactions. One of the biggest problem of any type of fraud detection models is every time the model becomes intelligent, the fraudsters also become intelligent. So the same techniques that worked yesterday for your model will not work anymore because people are changing it. And this uh, model applies even for uh, intrusion detection too, or spam detection, or any type of uh, unusual activity. So this is another paper uh, published recently, I think, and uh, identifying um, what could be a fraud transaction. There were a few clustering techniques applied and a few classification techniques. And the most commonly used classification techniques, you actually have naive base, SVM, logistic, and decision tree. Uh, even though naive base has uh, been there for the last 30, 40 years, and I've heard many people using it, um, I have not seen in the recent past um, value base being used as frequently for uh, the classification. So my rec first recommendation is maybe that should not be your first model to pick for classification. SVM is a, a very strong uh, technique, and I do have a slide at the later towards the end explaining some of the pros and cons of SVM, and then we can talk about why that's a better model many times. Uh, random forest or decision tree here, of course, is a, a single tree, but if it's instead of one single tree, I would actually propose to use multiple trees, which is called Random forest, random forest is another good technique. Uh, the problem with random forest is you don't know when to clip the trees, when to stop breaking the data into multiple branches. Uh, but if you can figure out, then uh, random tree is another good technique too. So in this case, if you look at the um, expectations ma maximization, k-means, farthest first, x-means. Farthest first and x-means are variations of k-means technique. So if you know k-means techniques, uh, the farthest first and x-means would be another variation of it. So you don't have to study these too much if you know this, but if you actually have some sort of a, a density techniques and k-means techniques and expectation maximization. Here is an interesting insight into how do you distribute the training data versus the test data. Uh, for a fraud detection, you don't find, uh, uh, I don't know if you worked on any type of fraud data earlier, the, the fraudulent transactions will be typically 0.005% of the whole transaction. So you never find a balanced data. If you're looking for a balanced data, you'll never find it. And, and you can't even apply the upsampling, downsampling techniques as frequently. I've seen some, some people using it. Sometimes synthetic data works when you're trying to augment the data, but for a, for a, a, a fraud type of a use case where the examples of the fraud and the types of frauds are changing over a period of time. You can't apply these data augmentation or synthetic data techniques because uh, you, after, you don't know what type of augmentation techniques you need to use constantly. But um, yeah, the, fifth, the interesting part is 50-50 division, 60-40-70-30, and 99 to 1. 99 to 1 makes sense because your data, the Right, correct transactions may be 99.999, and the fraud transactions are 0.005%, and maybe this may work. But I've seen this model, this division is not that fantastic. 95 to 5 or 90 to 10 would be a good rate for a fraud type of transactions. Uh, again, as I said, fraud could be credit card fraud, warranty fraud, intrusion deduction, spam deduction, any type of. Uh, division of, uh, of, of actions into good and bad areas. And this also, but this, these models actually gave really high accuracy. So for a fraud transaction, I think if you're using any clustering me, uh, methods, k-means I think would work really well, and, and for in the classifications, you have SVM and random forest would be two good techniques 
to use uh, uh, to find uh, to classify uh, this type of task. When you say you are a data scientist, and if I say, okay, how much data you need to detect? Uh, uh, how many of you are going to visit the next year's conference here? You need to, you would say we need to have a large amount of data, right? Maybe 200 people, 300 people, 500 people. What if I say, oh, hey, I have only six data points. Can you design a model and test the model also? Here is one example. And another reason why this example is interesting is, when you know, when you want to know when the economy is in recession, you know how recession is defined in economics. Two consecutive quarters of negative growth is called a recession. So when you know your economy is in recession, it's already six months. That means you you were in recession for six months and you do not even know that. So. For every other instance in the world where you forecast, you predict in the future, here is a use case of now casting, predicting whether you are in recession now, which is more important than figuring out after six months. So this is a study done in the United States, uh, the paper published as recently as March of 2019. Between, I think, 1975 and 2016, there were only six official re uh, recessions. So they, the authors actually designed a model which studies two for training purposes and uses four for testing purposes. And actually, it does a decent job. The gray bars are the official definitions when the recessions were, and these blue on the on, 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 on the, on the red bars are when the the model is predicting a recession. Very high accuracy rate. Now, I don't think you would ever find a use case like this where you are given only very, very few data points. Um, this is one of the first study papers I have read myself where uh, you can design a machine learning model with such a few data points. I do believe that you need to have a good amount of data points. But I, I used to believe that you need to have you need to have thousands or tens of thousands or millions of data points at least two years ago. Now I know maybe with 1,000 points, even 5,000 points, you can have a decent machine learning model. I believe in that. But this six data points is too few. But they use support vector machines. The reason I picked up for this paper for today is my personal bias towards SVM. SVM is a fantastic uh, classification model. A support vector vector machines is a model that can design a hyperplane that separates <coughs> the data points in the data cluster into two or more classes where the support vector, those points that form along the hyperplane are distinctly identified and the, hyper, the distance between the hyperplanes are, uh, are maximum. So SVM really works nice for classification. If you want more information about how this model was developed and how it worked, etc., you can read the paper, but in this case, with very, very few limited data points, support vector machine actually did a very good job. You may ask the question, is it possible that the model was overfitting? It was it's not the case. The model did not overfit. I will not explain it now, but you can read the paper to figure out how they figured out it's not overfitting. Okay, let's go to another financial services. Credit risk prediction. So if you are giving loans to a small business or an individual, how would you know that the loan is going to be repaid? So the credit risk itself. So you're trying to predict who's going to pay you back, if, whether people are going to pay the loan back consistently on a monthly basis or whatever. And there were three techniques used, adaptive boosting, ADA boosting, ADA boost, and you have the gradient boosting, and the next variation of this extreme gradient boosting, XG boost, but this is just a gradient boosting here, and then you have the logistic regression. Three simple techniques. Four years ago, five years ago, when I was trying to understand how many of these machine learning techniques work, I thought a model which is complex enough would really go, do a fantastic job. Like when deep learning models were introduced, I think, three, four years ago, 
I thought they are so better than the classical machine learning techniques. There's some, to some extent, they are good, better. I think for one reason it's better, you don't have repeated engineering for deep learning models. Having said that, classical machine learning techniques are doing a fantastic job. Even though I don't like the linear regression anymore, logistic regression works a good number of times, not all the time. SVM, HGBoost, or some other techniques really, really work. Random forest works really well for your classification techniques. Uh, logistic regression, I think, also I found uh, doing a good, good job. Here, the interesting reason why I think you all should read this paper is there's something called Shoke fuzzy integral. So the model, which is, you know, you have three different models being developed, one using Ada boost, the other one is gradient boosting, and the logistic regression. The models are made as an ensemble using Shoke fuzzy integral. So it actually, it does not do a random averaging of the answers by three models. It integrates the answers put from the three models based on the intensity or the importance of each of the model. And the, the, the Shoke integral would automatically figure that out. Uh, Shoke integral is more of a, a statistical technique, not really a machine learning technique. But that was used here in this case to integrate the outcomes of three different models and then improve the robustness of the ensemble. So you should check that out. Okay. Uh, autoencoders. Have you heard of autoencoders? Uh, autoencoders, when they were introduced, I think, some time ago, it's just a basic neural network with uh, three layers, one hidden, uh, one input layer, output layer, and a hidden layer. It was a very, very basic autoencoder. The purpose it was initially introduced was to reduce the noise in the data. So it input the data, and autoencoders will output the same data but less noisy. That was the primary objective long time ago when people introduced uh, uh, autoencoders. But later on now you have different variations of uh, uh, autoencoders. You have uh, variation autoencoders, denoising autoencoders, bidirectional autoencoders, stacked autoencoders, stacked bidirectional autoencoders. There's so many different variations available. And there are other purposes being used. Uh, in addition to denoising the data, autoencoders are used to create latent representations of your data set. Let's say you are, uh, uh, you are, you are uh, designing a model about, let's say, the company, different companies, or maybe your customers, <coughs> or different computers, you're trying to find out how different machines work in your data center. You can convert each of the data points into some sort of a latent re representation, and you can use autoencoders for that. I won't describe how you can create, uh, but let's say you create the latent, latent representations, here is an example of a uh, uh, paper published again in March of 2019. What month are we in? May. So two months ago. Uh, of identifying customers who have taken car loans. This is, a, a, I think, Norwegian car loan data, data set and Finnish car loan data set. And of course, you actually have a data set from Kaggle. Look at the beauty of latent representations of the customers and when you plot them, if you convert the customers into n-dimensional vectors and then you plot them in an n-dimensional space, it's so beautiful that you find customers of similar nature fall together. So if you know all of these customers, cluster one were the customers who normally default, you have a model that every time a new customer comes in, you convert the customer into a vector and plot it in this uh, picture, and if that customer vector falls closer to this vector, uh, closer to this cluster, or to this cluster, or to this, you can automatically know whether this customer is going to default or not. Extremely simple method of <coughs> making predictions using uh, deep learning methods, in this case, of course, autoencoders. Bankruptcy prediction. How would you know a company is going to go bankrupt, especially if it's like a small business you're trying to give loans to, or you're trying to engage with, if you're a mid-sized company or a big company, or you don't want to engage with a company which may have the potential to go bankrupt. bankrupt. Here is another model, uh, paper published, I think, uh, sometime in the, in the recent past. Um, for the same data set, there were around 10 different techniques used. The reason I picked up this is, 
when you do your research on what would be a good technique, you have different papers. Each of the paper may talk about one specific technique or a specific use case for a specific data set. You would not be able to compare between one paper to the other paper because there are two different techniques, but then the use cases are different too. The data sets are different too. This is one paper which actually compares for the same data set 11 different techniques. That's the good part. And the bad part is good number of, maybe I think KNNs and Random Forest are showing really good results. Uh, but you should read this paper about which techniques work here. Um, according to the authors, of course, Random Forest worked and SVM worked and KNN worked. Um, KNN is, is the, um, the, the three, these techniques work in, in this uh, paper. So till now, if, if you look into my emphasize on one of the techniques I've been, I seem to be in favor of SVM, uh, random forest, and uh, sometimes logistic regression. Okay, let's go to, okay. This is uh, further uh, information on uh, comparison of various models. Um, Uh, this is a comparison of uh, various techniques uh, during the training time, how much time each of the techniques takes for certain responses, the time to fit, the number of errors, <coughs> misclassification error rate and stuff, and you see the, the best ones are shown in green and the bad, really bad ones are shown in red, and average performance is shown in yellow. You, f you find the, the this model actually this model actually has three greens logistic regression and then uh, similarly uh, you, you can you can do the evaluation yourself about how the techniques work this is a unique use case I, I was very interested to see when you if, are, are anyone are you geologist when you are you interested in digging the earth to find the uh, precious metal and petroleum yeah, I don't know if you've studied that that the world uh, that world. You can do. You have there's a lot of scientific methods available to find whether there's going to be water under the table or uh, or even petroleum under the table. Uh, it's, it's it's but they're notoriously unreliable techniques. You just don't know. You you spend a lot of money to dig, but sometimes you don't even find. Here is a. a a paper which was published uh, December of 2018 to detect what would be the production of petroleum after a certain time based on how much you spend in, in uh, digging and uh, uh, doing exploratory work. Typical product, uh, predictions, you, you don't have to predict one single number, you actually can predict in a range. Um, you see the predictions shown here as a massively wide range and then the green lines here happens to be the realities uh, that go around. But there are three techniques uh, used, exponential weighted average forecasting, and then you have the rich regression and lasso regression. I have not used lasso regression um, at all, and I've used only one something rich <coughs> regression. I don't have too much of familiarity with this technique, but these models work too. I got the hint that I have five more minutes to store. I'm going to jump, and then so that I can have more questions. Um, this is uh, European Space Agency launched something called Mars Express space, spacecraft some time ago, and uh, there were 33 different systems on on, on board of this Mars Explorer, uh, predicting what will be the uh, the power consumption of all of these systems because there's no un unlimited supply of batteries on the Mars supply. They were just working on, on, on sunlight and. Uh, tracking how much will be the power consumption because time of the day action certain systems are performing if some systems are sending messages back to earth they're taking more con more power consumption so time of the day actions being done and type of uh, uh, activities uh, would vary the power consumption and you look into uh, again three different techniques the XG boost and stochastic gradient boosting techniques used um, please read the paper I do have more data, but I don't think we have 
So using uh, deep learning methodology like using GANs to identify um, predicting which of these uh, suitcases when you're in the airport, when you check in the suitcase, to identify which suitcase may have an unusual object in it so that it's a security hazard. Um, using GANs, I think this paper published again last year sometime. Um, so deep learning method again being used to detect anomalies. Uh, another deep learning uh, example <coughs> to detect uh, um, anomalies in the surveillance traffic, traffic uh, videos. If you have uh, traffic cameras in various sections, uh, how do you identify something uh, anomaly is going? Okay, I'm going to skip this. this. Um, uh, here's a use case I think you may want to read uh, if you can find. If this is the amount of, this is the data you have about consumption of electricity. This is a data set from, it's called Turkish electricity data, and you want to find out the consumption. Um, it's not that easy to find. Uh, so time series is a, is a common series of use cases you'll normally find. Um, you'll, you'll have to find some techniques. Uh, my, this thing is not working fast enough. Okay. Where do I show this to turn it? Okay. This is the um, daily consumption, electricity consumption, and then this is the weekly electricity consumption, and if you're asked to make a prediction, uh, how much will be the uh, consumption next week, next month, next year, um, just by the naked eye, you cannot make a prediction, and time series actually helps you detecting what it is. Uh, you can read about this paper more here. I'm actually going to show my recommendations. Uh, this is a paper published on which models are, uh, uh, which model you can use to uh, detect for vehicle maintenance. If you have a large number of vehicles, if you are maintaining a taxi company or whatever, how would you do it? Is there a way you can move it to? Uh, here is another paper I think you should read. Uh, an experiment done using around 15 to 16 simple machine learning techniques. You actually have 10 nearest neighbors, local outlier factors, uh, influential local outlier factors, uh, uh, and so many other techniques on the same data set and how each of the technique performs. Which techniques gives more accuracies and which, but which techniques are deterministic and which are sensitive to data. This would be a fantastic report for you to make a judgment for yourself, which technique to pick. Uh, plus plus is very high and negative is bad and then zero is neutral. Um, okay. These are some of my recommendations. You have linear regression, as I mentioned earlier, prone to overfitting. Parameters are difficult to interpret, so I would not use linear regression too often. Decision trees are, are really good, especially random forest, I think is really good uh, technique to use. Uh, naive base, even though I've been used in, in so many different uh, uh, areas, I have not seen off late being used too many times. Uh, neural networks, of course, um, they're easy to implement, you don't have to do feature engineering, they learn from the data a lot more easily than the classical machine learning techniques, but of course it's difficult to interpret, especially the, in the context of explainable machine learning and all this stuff, it's, 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 you've got to be careful about neural networks. Um, random forest, again, I do have a bunch of pros and cons. Um, in, uh, you can read it later, but the summary is, you should use random forest or XGBoost or SVM wherever it's possible. Okay, these are my recommendations. The right technique is dependent on the use case data, always of course. There's no one single technique that works for everything. Uh, KNN is the best for global issues if you actually want to find out uh, what is a spa spam email versus not a spam email. But if you want to find out uh, within the type of sp spams, um, especially in a cold start situation, something is not really a spam, or the model feels it's a, it's a spam, and, and hence uh, the KNN does not work in those situations. Localized outlier factor prefers when you want, when you have lo a lot of local issue. Uh, let's say a credit card transactions, uh, uh, if you have a consistent uh, 
below fifty dollar expenses and, and you suddenly have a thousand dollar expense, that's it, sir. That's a global that's very easy. But even if you have below fifty dollar expenses, suddenly uh, a thirty five dollar expense appears on a credit card statement, which which seems to be unusual because of some other reason. That's a local outlier factor, and then uh, LOF would be uh, uh, easier to use. Arima is preferred for a long time till artificial neural networks came. So you may want to use artificial neural networks. We're not sure use deep learning methods, ANNs, uh, but if you want to use just a classical machine learning method, XGBoost has been performing really, really well. Uh, in a dual class or one class or multi-class SBM works in many cases too. Uh, that's my recommendation. Okay, the best slide is this. Thank you. Slido, please vote on the questions because there are too many questions to be answered. So if you want some questions to appear, just vote in Slido. Thank you. This is uh, important to finish things at the end. So we can talk here for things. So uh, very specific use case. Millions or billions of observations. Maybe a few hundred raw variables on time series. Very few cases. So this is predictive maintenance, rare event, uh, well, failure prediction or detection. Uh, where would your intuition be? Like, which which of those helps us out? Um, if you have billions of instances, but I would differentiate between the data points and the features. If you have, uh, 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 plus an additional component is that maybe you have only hundred hundred machines that you know produce billions of points. So the actual justification is important. And the use case is to find which machine is performing well. Or which uh, one is going to break? Oh, which one's gonna break? Okay. Um, this is a common use case for data centers, and yeah, even though you have commoditized machines, uh, you don't want to uh, lose uh, even a $2,000 machine on a regular basis. Um, um, uh, the, you know, I would pick between, I, I know we don't have time, but I can explain uh, the logic behind, but I would pick, I would start working with XGBoost or SEM. Uh, to start identifying which machine is going to fail and then use it, and uh, especially between the two, I would start using SGBoost because it's extremely fast. I've seen many models with uh, at least a million error points. It's running in milliseconds. It actually gives you answers within uh, 20, 30, 40 milliseconds. So I would use SGBoost. But again, uh, there are lots of uh, papers published by Google and other. Uh, there's one paper published by data, Google on data center uh, management, but they have used deep learning uh, methods uh, there. And I know they could afford to do that too, but if you're looking for a simpler method, I think I would recommend it. Thank you. I can maybe switch on Slido to, to the questions. So, several popular questions. Colonel, less than five. Yes. Experience with models for predicting availability of million fuse assets by utility companies mostly times. That was your question? I think so. <coughs> This is the question we just answered, I think. Yeah, I saw what is your question? question asking, wants to give more detail on that one, or was it answered with the previous question? Then we can move. Yeah, this is five, I think, total size. Uh, rare events. Predictive modeling is, of course, predicting the rare event itself, um, or, or, or understanding uh, the model. Rain events is very similar to your fraud transactions. And you can use some of the techniques used for fraud detection. Uh, the problem with fraud, as I mentioned earlier, the rare event, they change their nature, so the design, or the definition of a rare event changes constantly. Um, so rare events is a very standard term used for uh, techniques used to detect fraud or varieties of fraud. Maybe just on the other one, on the kernel to use, um, any recommendation on which of the kernel, like linear, polynomial, RBF and so on. I guess that was maybe a... Oh, that was a question. Um, yes. I mean, do you have, based on your experience? That I've seen RBF, I think, used a little more frequently, but I, I would I would experiment uh, on other different types of kernels. Yeah. yeah, I don't have a specific answer for that. No, I don't have a recommendation there. Um, very events, I think, that's what you do. Use the, this is very similar to a fraud detection technique. So, uh, if, you, the, if you do research on, uh, all machine learning techniques being used for uh, fraud detection. 
Of late, many financial service companies or fintech companies are using deep end methods uh, to identify uh, unusual activity. Um, so you can use uh, ANNs uh, to start with for our Maybe I will just also go back to the audience if there is any questions that you want to ask before we go back. Uh, okay, so I guess, okay yeah, this one is also... Is there is just one question from the audience, and then... Oh, yes, yes, yeah, yes, please, sorry. Uh, um, I was wondering, so you you recommended XGBoost and also Random Forest. So they are similar in a way that too. they combine like weak classifiers, right? But like, why would you choose, which one would you choose over the other in the domain? Yeah. Now I think it's it's coming to a dangerous zone of picking one model, and then uh, I don't think that's the right thing to do. You always want to do an ensemble. You want to do uh, uh, different uh, experiment with different methods and, and, and do. My objective was to, to when, you, when I say use SVM random forest XG boost to start with. If you have a tight deadlines to implement a model and if you have the data, these are some of the techniques which have shown really good performance over time. There may be a use case where a linear regression works fantastic for you. That's a possibility. Even though I personally don't like linear regression, that has been used sometimes. So the recommendations I'm making today are not to be taken in such a way that, okay, you ignore everything else and only work on this. Having said that, I would always prefer an ensemble in place of one model. So in other words, instead of one, I would pick multiple. And then if I have a multiple models, I would not give the same importance to each the model. I would do <coughs> some hierarchy of weightage to the outcomes of the models and then mix the uh, model. I talked about Shoke fuzzy integral. There are so many other, um, I think there's another fuzzy integral. I forgot the name. Uh, Sugune, I think is the name of the other fuzzy integral. Off I've been using more of artificial neural networks for majority of the alternative models. For you guys today, as a takeaway, my recommendation is to start using XGBoost and, and, and SVM and uh, Forest or unpredictable model. Uh, but that should not be the only one, only one you should start uh, working on. Maybe you should work on uh, ensemble. So that's what I'm not trying to clarify. If, I, if I've got your question wrong, you can repeat the question and I'll answer again. But uh, that's what my objective was and I would recommend you Another question from the audience? Uh, thank you. I really like the matrix that you put up with the different methods and uh, the different categories where they perform well or not so well. You, are you aware of any study that does this for different aspects of data that you can analyze or different kind of use cases? Because that would be interesting, right? To have different characteristics of your data and then look at what the performance is relatively, also taking into account the computational cost. And uh, are you aware of any study that does that? In a more like a data study? Yeah. I have seen a few papers uh, where the computation expense also was computed, uh, including not just the time it takes to compute the size of the data and the number of GPUs and the number of clocks uh, and the memory it takes. Uh, there are a few papers published. I think if you go to Google Research and, and, and Microsoft Research, I think you may find some papers. Um, but an exhaustive research I've not seen which will compare all types of data. Uh, but for certain industries like fraud, data center management, um, industry 4.0, predictive modeling for machines when they're gonna fail or vehicles when they're gonna fail. Um, and, and these are three or four types of use cases which are written about in many, many uh, areas. I think you may find some comparative analysis. But the, the very nature of data, because the data is so different, every company has different data, different way of uh, saving, uh, different way of collecting, uh, analyzing, upsampling, uh, up downsampling, data augmentation. I think if you can automate that part, then many jobs about data science engineers will disappear, so I don't want that to happen. So, uh, and that's still a sign, uh, still an art right now. Uh, a data scientist can open the look at the uh, data and then can personally feel 
how the data is. That's the reason why when you do any machine learning model, even today, 80% therefore just goes on looking at the data, processing the data. The technique detection, developing a model, using the technique and testing a model is almost trivial in that context. It's only 20% of the time, 80% times data. So I, I have not seen, but some information could be found if you go to Google search and the Microsoft search. Thank you. And so we are running out of time, but maybe if you want to have a look at the first okay. second one, if you can answer one. Vibrational one. frequency data is very similar to any industry 4.0 data, uh, industry 4.0 use cases of predicting when a, when a machine is going to break, um, which is similar to, I think, some type of fraud transactions because you have very few fraud, uh, transactions of fraud. And here also very few vibrations. So you need to convert these signals into numeric data. So many times you take a, a, a window of 10 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds, whatever it is, as a window, and take an average uh, signal, either at the start or the end or the middle, uh, and then make that as a data point and take multiple windows. Many times I've seen overlapping windows being used as, as data point collection so that you actually have consistency. Uh, and then you don't have to use uh, ARIMA methods or the time series method for that. So I would use the, uh, the whatever techniques you use for fraud detection for vibration too. And because vibration data, frequency data are not numeric data, you need to convert the signals into numeric data. And maybe the last one, yes. <coughs> oh, the last one, okay. yes. Yeah, this one you can take as yes. I can ask, uh, recommend your AutoML framework. There are lots of AutoML frameworks available. I think there is one uh, um, as simple as uh, H2O as a uh, paid company. They have an AutoML. Google actually has their own AutoML framework too, I think. Uh, I think Google calls it AutoML itself, even though AutoML is a generic name, Google's AutoML is called AutoML. XGBoost, for text, anything text, year 2018 has been a seminal year for text classification. A model called BERT, B-E-R-T, another model called ELMO, E-L-M-O, another model called E-L-M FIT, and two other models called Google Transformer and Fast AI dot, uh, uh, Fast dot AI Transformer. These five models are some variations of language models which do a fantastic job on text processing. Any type of text processing, whether it's NER, POS, sentiment analysis, tra language translation, anything, TTS, text to speech, speech to text, whatever it is, all can be done. So don't even think of using any other techniques like HGBoost and stuff, it's just use for those four or five techniques. So there are other questions that we have to uh, look at because of the time, so thank you very much. I Local you... outlier factor. <laughs> thank you. Thank Perfect. you. You will be here also for the uh, for the group discussion. Just 330. Yeah. I had to really drive back to uh, Zurich and like, it's going to be a five hour drive for me, but I'll stay till. We have to catch you in the next hour or two if you want to discuss with yeah. the other. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.